In the world of soul music, Otis Redding was riding a wave of growing fame. Starting from humble beginnings, he worked hard and became known as the King of Soul, captivating audiences with his incredible voice and unforgettable songs. But amidst his rise to fame, tragedy struck, and the music world would lose one of its greatest. Join us as we explore the incredible journey of Otis Redding, from his meteoric rise to his untimely demise. Otis Redding Jr. was born on September 9, 1941, in Dawson, Georgia. When he was just five years old, the family moved to Macon. Here he grew up listening to famous singers like Sam Cooke and Little Richard. As a little boy, Otis started singing in his church's choir and learned how to play the guitar and piano, and by the time he was 10, he was taking lessons to improve his drumming and singing skills. He even sang in the high school band at Ballard Hudson High School, and on Sundays he earned $6 by singing gospel music on a local Macon radio station. However, at the age of 15, his father became ill with tuberculosis, and Otis dropped out of school to support his family. While working part-time digging wells and at other odd jobs, he joined the Upsetters, a band that used to play with his idol Little Richard before he started his solo career. Otis Redding's breakthrough came in 1958, at the age of 17, when he participated in a talent show called The Teenage Party, hosted by disc jockey Hamp Swain at the Roxy and Douglas Theatres. A well-known local guitarist, Johnny Jenkins, was watching and noticed that the band backing Otis wasn't very good. At that point, Johnny decided to play with Otis himself, who chose to sing Heebie Jeebies by Little Richard. This combination helped Otis win the talent contest for 15 straight weeks, earning him a $5 prize each time. During one of these shows, Otis met the love of his life, Zelma Atwood, who was 17 years old at the time. And about a year later, Zelma and Otis had their first child, Dexter, in the summer of 1960. Otis and Zelma got married in August 1961 and they would eventually have three children together. However, by 1960, Otis was set on chasing bigger dreams and made the decision to leave his newborn family behind in search of better opportunities in Los Angeles, California. And it was there that he recorded his first singles and eventually signed a contract with Stax Records. And it wasn't long before he recorded These Arms of Mine, a heartfelt ballad he had written. This track quickly gained popularity, reaching number 20 on the R&B charts in 1963. Known for his high energy in the recording studio, Otis went on to record his third album, Otis Blue, Otis Redding Sings Soul, in just one day in 1965. As a songwriter, Otis, often in collaboration with Steve Cropper, brought a fresh take on rhythm and blues with a sound that was sharp, straightforward, and powerfully vivid. In a 2015 interview with WMTV, Otis's daughter, Carla, reflected on her father's legacy. She shared, he didn't really think he could sing that well. According to my mother, he'd say, well, you know, I, I don't dance well, I don't really sing that great, but I just do what I can do. But the rest of the world didn't seem to agree with Otis's modest opinion of himself. Initially, his music resonated mainly with African-American audiences, but it wasn't long before he broke through to a broader American pop audience. Starting with small shows in the South alongside his band, Otis's journey took him to larger stages, including the famed Whiskey A Go Go nightclub in Los Angeles, and then across the Atlantic to perform in major European cities like London and Paris. A pivotal moment came in 1967 at the Monterey Pop Festival, where his performance captivated the mostly white crowd. Until then, Otis had mainly performed for black audiences, but this event marked a turning point, setting the stage for his mainstream success. The final song of what would become his last major concert was Try a Little Tenderness, which he ended with an improvised chorus telling the audience, I gotta go y'all, but I don't wanna go. And just as Otis's career was soaring to new heights, something unexpected happened. On December 10th, 1967, Otis was set to perform at the Factory Nightclub in Madison, Wisconsin. Earlier that day, he phoned home and his wife later mentioned that she told him he sounded depressed. Otis brushed it off, saying he was just tired. The band had just played three shows in two nights at Leo's Casino, and the day before, they had been guests on the upbeat television show in Cleveland. Otis had hoped to talk to all of his children, but only Otis III was awake. Father and son exchanged a few words before Otis said goodbye to his wife. He playfully advised her to be real sweet and real good, leaving out a direct I love you 
a phrase he seldom used easily. One wonders if he would have said those words had he known what the rest of the day would bring. That afternoon, around 12.30 p.m., Otis Redding and five members of his band, the Barkays, guitarist Jimmy King, saxophonist Phelan Jones, organist Ronnie Caldwell, trumpet player Ben Cauley, drummer Carl Cunningham, and their valet, Matthew Kelly, climbed aboard a twin-engine Beechcraft H-18, which Otis had recently bought. The pilot was Richard Fraser, who had 1,290 hours of flying experience, with 118 of those in Beechcraft planes. Another band member, James Alexander, ended up on a commercial flight due to a lack of space on Otis's private plane. At the time, James thought he had drawn the short straw, but he would soon realize he was, in fact, the lucky one. When musician James Brown found out that Otis was flying the same model of plane he had once decided to get rid of, he warned him about the risks involved. James later reflected on the last conversation he had with Otis, saying, On the last morning we talked, I said that plane is not big enough to be doing what you're doing. It can't carry all those people and all that equipment. You shouldn't be messing around with it like that. James continued, That plane was an old plane with a bad battery and a lot of service problems and it had no business flying in that kind of weather. The weather was poor that day, with heavy rain and fog, and people at the airport advised Otis not to fly. They told him, the weather is too bad and you shouldn't go. You need to cancel this gig. But Otis replied, man, I've never missed a day in my life and I'm not going to start now. Otis, who took pride in never missing a performance, didn't want to let down his fans. Despite the risks, he made the decision to proceed with the flight, saying, gotta make that dollar. And besides that... The pilot convinced Otis that he could get him and his band to Madison safely. So the group of eight took off from Cleveland, Ohio, heading west towards Madison. As they approached Truax Field in Madison, just four miles from their destination, everything seemed to be going smoothly, and at 3.25 p.m., pilot Richard Fraser radioed for permission to land. However, shortly after, tragedy struck. The aircraft began its descent, navigating through thick clouds on its approach to land, which required it to fly over Lake Monona before reaching the airport. But just as they were nearing the shore, something went terribly wrong. No one will ever know exactly what happened on that day, only that the engine suddenly sputtered and stopped functioning. With low visibility due to low fog, the pilot was forced to rely on solely instruments for navigation, assuming they were still functioning properly at this point. In essence, he was flying blind. An eyewitness on the lakeshore reported seeing the plane flying with its left wing lower than the right before sharply banking and crashing into the lake, approximately half a mile from the land. Remarkably, the aircraft remained intact upon impact, floating on the surface of the icy lake for several minutes, gently bobbing up and down before it slowly started sinking. The Barkay's band member and trumpet player Ben Cauley, who had been asleep in the plane, was awakened by his bandmate, Phelan Jones, who exclaimed, Oh no, while looking frightened through his window. In a split second, Ben quickly unbuckled his seatbelt and found himself plunged into the icy lake, clutching a seat cushion to stay afloat amidst the freezing cold. Unable to swim, Ben held tightly onto the cushion as he helplessly witnessed each of his friends slowly drowning and freezing to death, their desperate screams for help echoing across the lake. Ben painfully remembered, I saw Carl come out of the water, and I saw Matt come up on the other side. Ronnie's cries for help were heartbreaking, but eventually they all went silent, claimed by the cold lake. And just when Ben thought he couldn't hold on any longer, police officers on a boat found him, not far from where the dead bodies of two other men were floating, later identified as Richard Fraser and Jimmy King. After the incident was reported, rescue teams were quickly notified and additional help was dispatched following emergency calls from locals. The first responders were there within minutes. Though the choppy, frigid waters made it difficult to maneuver to the wreckage, it took the rescue team 17 minutes to get there, fast enough to save Ben, but unfortunately, too late for the others. By then, the plane had sunk to the lake's depths. Suffering from the early stages of frostbite, Ben was rescued and taken to the hospital. There, he was treated for his exposure to the cold, yet, astonishingly, he had sustained no serious injuries. He shared with the rescue team, and later the media, that he had heard the desperate cries of two men close to him, until suddenly, there was silence, and they were gone, swallowed by the lake. 
He was unaware of the fate of the others until a police officer came up to him and mentioned how lucky he was. When Ben asked why, the officer told him the heartbreaking news, because everybody else is dead. Meanwhile, fans were already in line at the concert venue when news of the plane crash broke. They went home that evening hoping that Otis had somehow survived. And that was his wife's hope too. Around 5 p.m., she received a call from the Madison coroner, who detailed the events leading up to the recovery of a body described as a tall and dark black man wearing a black undershirt, likely referring to the still unidentified Jimmy King. Trying to keep her cool and push away a wave of rising fear, she responded sharply, that's not Otis. She pointed out that Otis never wore underwear and was an excellent swimmer. He was out there alive, they just hadn't found him yet. Go find him, she demanded. However, the aircraft had plummeted to the lake's 40-foot depths, coming to rest at a 45-degree angle with its nose buried deep into the silt, its body twisted and torn open and missing its left wing and engine. Apart from the two individuals found near Ben Colley, there was no trace of the other passengers or the pilot. The divers faced harsh and dangerous conditions as they searched the waters for hours on end. When they resumed their rescue mission the following morning, they made a horrendous discovery. Otis was found, still buckled into his seat. Otis died at the age of 26 and was survived by his wife Zelma and their three children, Dexter, Carla, and Otis III. The detailed reason why the plane crashed remains a mystery, even after the NTSB looked into it. But the circumstances leading up to the accident might give us some indication of what might have happened. After the plane reached its cruising height, Otis walked up to the cockpit and sat in the co-pilot seat. This raises a big question. Did he ever actually fly the plane, especially in such bad weather? Otis wasn't yet a licensed pilot. He was only allowed to fly if a pilot was with him and if there were no passengers on board. So the idea of him controlling the plane seems far-fetched. Yet, this question led to a lot of guessing and speculation, especially because of what happened next. It's also important to remember that flying used to be a lot more dangerous in the past than it is today. Flying on smaller, private planes was especially risky because the pilots and mechanics were often less experienced, the planes weren't maintained as well, and they often flew in and out of smaller airports that didn't have the safety features bigger airports do. But the most important factor is that there was heavy rain and fog at the destination airport where the plane was making its approach, and bad weather is known to be a culprit in many aviation accidents. And even though the pilot knew how to fly using just the plane's instruments, which is helpful in bad weather, we still don't know exactly what went wrong that night. Only that an eyewitness on the lakeshore reported seeing the plane with its left wing lower than the right before it sharply banked and crashed into the lake. Ironically, Otis's dream of widespread success was realized only after his passing. Just three days before his tragic death, he recorded a new song called Sittin' on the Dock of the Bay, a song he had written three months earlier while on the deck of a houseboat in Sausalito, California. Inspired by the Beatles album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Otis aimed to craft a similar sound despite objections from his record label and his wife. The Stax team also expressed dissatisfaction with the new direction, fearing it would harm the label's reputation as a hub for R&B music. However, Otis was determined to expand his musical horizons, firmly believing that Dock of the Bay was his best work and destined for chart-topping success. Sadly, Otis passed away before witnessing its success, but his intuition proved to be right. Upon its release in January 1968, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay soared to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, becoming Otis's first and only number one single. Remarkably, it also became the first posthumous number one single in US chart history, selling approximately 4 million copies worldwide and receiving over 8 million airplays. Despite his short time in the spotlight, Otis Redding made a huge impact on the music world and got the nickname King of Soul. He was one of the first to pioneer soul music and left his mark on the genre with his heartfelt lyrics and unique vocal style. After his death, he was honored with inductions into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1989 and a Grammy Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1999. Nowadays, Otis Redding is considered one of the most influential singer-songwriters in American music history, particularly in the realms of soul and rhythm and blues.